Hey guys. Thank you all for coming. I know it's been a long day and I guess a pretty long night yesterday. So thank you all for taking the effort to come. Um, before we start, um, I, I have to apologize because, and this might sound very disappointing, I will not talk about Remedy games. Now there are two reasons. Number one, I joined the company barely a year ago, so that means I cannot take any credit whatsoever for all the awesome games they built. And number two, the awesome games that we are working on now, it's a little bit too early to talk about them. So yeah, um, if you wanted to hear about Remedy games, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna talk about it, you can, you can go now. Um, <laughs> but hopefully I'll have enough um, you know, practical examples that you'll still take something out of it. All right, um, so about 13 years ago, I escaped a soul-sucking corporate job making business software, and I went into game dev. And I didn't have any education in that matter whatsoever. Um, luckily, I was surrounded by very smart and very patient people, so I could literally rely on them, learning from them, and then you know they pointed me to the right books and uh, the right talks, and I started doing stuff myself with a lot, of, a lot of trial and error, and obviously mostly error. And here I am, 13 years later. Um, this is me for like the first 10 years in the industry. But yeah, 13 years I'm here, alive and making games and talking about it. Now, uh, as I was you know, moving through my career and kind of regardless of the team or the project I'm, I was working on, I started noticing that the real problem that we have is not really about how to make things. Like we have good designers who know how to design, we have good artists, they know how to make art, we have good programmers, they know how to write code, but we're not really sure, especially when it comes to gameplay, it kind of feels like we're just throwing ideas at a wall and hoping that something will stick. So here's a little classic story. Um, you know, we start with this awesome idea that we have, like we're gonna build a Death Star and there's going to be giant lasers and we're gonna be destroying planets. And then at some point during making the game, we kind of find ourselves like building that Death Star with a lot of duct tape and, and paper clips. And then like half of the team is really confused because they're like, why are we making a Death Star? in the first place and for some reason destroying planets is not exciting as we thought it would be and then everything is on fire and um, raise your hand if that sounds familiar, if like at least once that happened to you. Okay, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of heads. Now, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that if there's one thing that is easy in game dev is it's burning money. Um, and as we, as you know, as the industry evolves and, and we're trying to build bigger and more complex and sp experiences, I think it's absolutely crucial that we find more efficient ways to work, barely to survive, right? Because if we, if we don't, I think we're gonna be, it's very easy to find yourself in a position where you simply run out of money. So, um, now, all the things I'm gonna be talking about, it's, it's not really me being smart and figuring stuff out. It's, it's really stuff that I learned from other people and other books. Um, and it would be impossible to basically, you know, bring everybody that I learned from, because that would be hundreds of people. But I really wanna give a shout out to Alex Mandrika, a brilliant designer. I think this is the guy that had a biggest impact on, on my career, and I think I, I've learned from him most. And then these are really good books. Um, I'm gonna be dropping some fragments from those. And then Jordan Peterson, I didn't realize that I'm gonna put it here, but I'll, bear with me. All right. This might sound obvious, maybe trivial, but this is actually something that took me, and I, it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but it actually took me years to understand. Uh, oh, by the way, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, these are the three things. So, understanding player fantasy, structure of gameplay, and analyzing play experience. So, interactive games are interactive experiences. Now, it took me years to understand this. So, what does it really mean? It means that what this really is about is about what the player does. What do you do, and what do you feel when you're doing it? And I remember having a conversation with, um, 
uh, Dying Light's game director when I was really geeking out about like all the sexy Excel balance sheets that I set up and I was so proud of myself and all the you know, beautiful design docs that I had. And in the end, he said like, dude, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Like, it doesn't care how sophisticated your tech is. It, it all doesn't matter. What matters is the behaviors and emotions of the player. So if there's anything that you can take from this lecture, sorry, I'm going to go back real quick, uh, from this lecture, you know, look at your game. Look at a feature, at a mechanic, at a monster that you're building. You know, I, I have designers coming to me all the time and they're like, we're going to build this awesome monsters and it's going to have like four arms and like seven different attacks and it's like, it's going to be so cool. I'm like, yeah, but how, what, what do I do with it? Like, like when I fight the monster, what, what do I do? Not what the monster does, what, what do I do? And how is the monster supposed to make me feel, right? That, that's what matters. Now, what's at the heart of that experience is player fantasy. And the way, um, the way to think about player fantasy is really to try to answer this question, like, who do I play as? Like, who am I? And coming back to this previous slide, it's like, okay, so what do I do? And how does it feel, right? So imagine for a second, raise your hand if, you're, if you saw this movie. Who haven't seen this movie? Go watch this movie, it's a really good movie. All right, imagine we're making a game about the Batman, all right? This specific version of Batman, Nolan's Batman. Okay, shout, what does Batman do? Breaks bones, okay, he's fighting, right? And he's fighting multiple foes at the same time. He's, he's kind of predator, right? Like he can ambush people and he drives his Batmobile and he's solving cases and maybe flies his bat whatever and he has gadgets and all that, right? Um, now imagine that instead of this Batman, we're making this Batman. It's still Batman. But, but think about for a moment like how different things would have to be. Like how would different would the player do things and how different should they feel, right? Now what about this Batman? Much more grounded and maybe a little bit of depressing, right? It's all Batman. So which fantasy do you want? Now Batman is easy. Now I say easy because everyone knows Batman, right? And there's like a shit ton of um, source material that you can use, right, to, to figure out like, oh, I want, I want this part of Batman. So now I want to um, invite you to a little exercise. We're going to do something a little bit more weird, and we're going to try to build fantasy for space pirates. Okay, let's imagine we're going to make a game about space pirates. So again, like, well, what do, what do space pirates do, right? What do they do? Okay, so maybe they're flying their spaceships and they, they fight other spaceships in their spaceships, and maybe they fight in combat, and maybe they trade goods from whoever they stole them, and maybe they're negotiating with other pirates, and maybe governments, and maybe they're recruiting their crew, and they repair their ships, and they're navigating. Like, we could keep going, right? Now, with just like, look, we spent like, what, 30 seconds, right? But immediately we can see, oh, that's a pretty big game, right? Like, immediately you can see the scope a little bit. It's like, oh, that, that's a lot of shit to do. And also, each one of those bubbles is potential gameplay, right? Like, it, each one of those activities is something that you do. So if, you know, a game director comes to you and says, like, all right, so let's prototype flying spaceship. Would that be enough for you to, like, all right, I'm, okay, I'll do it. Well, the question is, like, well, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Like, we have to go deeper inside. So the question is, like, okay, flying spaceships. How does space pirate fly a spaceship, right? Like, what exactly do you mean? Like, maybe it's a pilot. You, 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 see, you, you, know, you sit in the front seat and you're holding your joystick and you're like, you're piloting. Or maybe we want something more like Star Trek, like you're actually Captain Picard and you're like sort of commanding officer, right? Like, like how, which, which one do you want? Like, it's all flying spaceships. What do you want? Maybe we want both. And that's where your producer probably gets a heart attack because he's like, <laughs> what, how the hell are we going to build this? So let's say we're like, you know what, we're, we're going to focus on the pilot thing. Like the game is going to be like, the way you fly is, is, is you're, you're a pilot. But it's like, uh, but do you want like Star Wars or like maybe Battlestar Galactica? Because they're very different. And then if we say, well, let's go with Star Wars, like which one? Like do you want the kind of space combat that is like in Empire Strikes Back, or maybe the one that is in Phantom Menace. 
very, very different. It feels, it feels different. It looks different, right? And then as we sort of start to commit to things like, oh, this is a game about flying spaceship, we can say like, hmm, do we actually need this? Like, if, if you're a pilot, like, would you be recruiting crew? Like, maybe we can already cut it here, right? Not somewhere in production. We can already, we're just forming the vision for our game, and we can already say like, all right, that, this is out. And then we just do it for every activity, right? So it's like, all right, how do you, how does space pirate repair their ship? Are there more like, you know, space mechanic, where you're like literally sitting in your ship and you're disassembling it and then like fixing something and putting it back on and, or maybe you're just, you know, I'm gonna visit the shipyard and I'm gonna pay some money and it's done. Like you can think like, okay, how much time do we want player to spend repairing their ship, right? Like how does it fit the rest of the game? And like, how do they fight? And I couldn't find cool pictures of space <laughs> pirates fighting, so I took Neo and John Wick. But you know, they're different, they're both Keanu. But one can, you know, jump between buildings and fly, and the other one is like down to earth and all. Like, how, how would you fight? Um, and then as you go through all this, you sort of need to ask yourself, what's at the core? So if we look at all these activities that we kind of line up for ourselves, which one is the heart of the game? Or in other words, like, what's the one thing that we cannot take out because it would be a different game? So maybe in our case, we can say, you know what? What this game is actually about is about flying spaceships. And that means everything else is just there to support flying spaceship. So maybe we get rid of recruiting, and maybe we get rid of in-person combat, and maybe we don't do negotiating because this is a game about flying um, spaceships. So a little bit more practical example. When we were working on Dead Island, this is actually the first game I, I ever worked on, the focus was melee combat, right? That's what the, uh, what's at the heart of the game. This game is about getting really close to your enemies and they're beating them to a pulp in a very gory way and cutting them to pieces. Dying Light, it also has melee combat, but the, f the, the, the thing at the core is parkour. That's what makes these two games different. So yeah, we have combat, but we had to design it in a way and balance it in a way with all the other systems so that we never overshadow parkour because this is what's at the heart of, your, of, the, of this game. Now, as you go through this process, one thing that you have to remember is that words are weak. So even if we speak the same language, when I tell you about like, here's what I want, here's how I think you, what you should be doing and how you should be feeling, it's, it's going to create different pictures in your head. So use pictures, use illustrations, use previous material, use fragments of other movies. So like, I'll give you an example. When we were working on both Dead Island and, and Dying Light, we would spend weeks watching every possible zombie movie with notebooks and saying like, okay, what kind of situations people get in those? And they're like, what do they do? How does it feel? And, like that, that helped us tremendously. So like whatever you do, you need to be able to convey emotions. So that how, that's how you sort of grab your, you know, your, you, you have a grasp of your, of your fantasy and what you're supposed to be doing and feeling. And then we can jump into like, okay, so let's, let's build gameplay for something. Okay, this will sound a little bit embarrassing again, <laughs> but uh, for a very long time, I didn't really understand what gameplay is. Um, many, many years. Um, I'm 13 years in the industry, and I think it's only started coming to me like in the recent years. Like I, I would, I would do it. I would build it. I would discuss it with with my colleagues, but I, I couldn't really, you know, point a finger. Sometimes we were looking at gameplay, and I couldn't say like why is it wrong or like how to even find the problem. And the sort of epiphany that, that, that got triggered was actually when I was reading uh, Jordan Peterson's book, and in, the whole book is about order and chaos, and there was this fragment that I came across. Um, can you read it? Is it big enough? Yeah? Okay, and then I was like, okay, uh, I really like the fragment where he says, when time passes and you're so engrossed in what you're doing, you don't notice, and it is there and then that you're located precisely on the border between order and chaos. And that was like, there was a moment of like, aha, I think I'm into something. And that, so, that sounded very similar to flow theory. 
You know what the flow is, right? Like we're, we're trying, we're aiming to get people into that flow state, which is a place that people are so involved in an activity that, that nothing else seems to matter. It's like, all right, all right, there's like, I think I can start to connect this, these, these dots. So I started literally making a map for, my, for myself, like, like, a, uh, like I was building a tool for myself to help me understand gameplay. So I was like, all right, so there's, there's this order on one side, and apparently on the other side, there's chaos. And I'm looking for something in the middle. And when I was reading a lot about this and, and thinking like, and this will be, this will sound very new agey <laughs> really quickly. So please bear with me. I came in, I, I, the picture that came to my mind was, was this, right? And then this quote really stuck in my mind. It's like, all right, on the border between order and chaos. Now, the other way to think about order and chaos is information, right? And information is all the things that the player knows, the rules, the goals, the, the abilities that I have, everything that I know. And then on the other hand, the chaos is the unknown. These are all the things that you explore. Maybe literally, like in Zelda, where you have the whole world to explore, or maybe it's just a chessboard and you're exploring possibilities of how to move pieces around. But I was still kind of missing, you know, some, some ingredients to it. And then I was talking to this junior designer and, and I was really impressed how, how much she knew about, about design. And I was like, you're just getting started and you're junior and I feel so stupid because I've been doing this for 10 years. Like, how is it possible that you know so much? And she told me about, you know, her university and I asked her what kind of books they were reading. And she pointed me to this book and I found this fragment. And the part about goal, uh, yeah, the, so you need to have, you need to let players make decision and then the decision making always takes the form of, I have a goal and how do I achieve it? So, all right, I'm gonna add that to my map. And when you think about goals, you know, you look at Mario, that's a very simple goal, just get to the castle, go to, to, far, to the far right end of the level and maybe it's like, you know, be the last man standing and maybe, you know, kill the dragon or just get on top of the, Mountain. And the interesting thing about goals, when you really think about it, is like there's two types of goals. One is the goals that you give to the player as a designer, like the, 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 the goals that the game mode sets for you, like, you know, kill the dragon, do this thing. But what you have to really remember is that the player has goals of their own. Because even though I'm on my way, you know, to kill the dragon or like be the last man standing, I have goals like, I want to find a gun or I need some ammo, or I want to find some health, or maybe even a trivial goal like, I want to see what's over there, like that's my goal. So you have to remember like not to create too much friction between what the, what the game asks you to do and what the player wants to do, right? Like it's easy, easy to, to, to create friction there. So right, so we got goals. What's on the other side? Any ideas? Close, yeah, yeah. So the answer came from yet another book that I read. Um, these are really good books. I keep coming back to them. And in general, it's conflict, right? And I really like this part when it says, yeah, conflict is designed into the game so that um, procedures, rules, and situations that do not allow player to achieve their goals directly, right? So what are these? Yeah, enemies, obstacles, the gap that you have to jump, other players that are trying to do the same thing. Maybe it's the stamina system. Maybe it's how the mountain, the climbing mechanic is built so that you have to figure out exactly at which angle to figure it out. So we've got the conflict com uh, component. What, what else is there? And I, from, from this point on, I was kind of getting obsessed with, with this thing. And so, yeah, like if we want to create conflict, we gotta have obstacles, <laughs> very well. And then, if I have obstacles, I need to be able to overcome them somehow, right? So on the order side of things, I have my abilities as a player. Like, I can, I can move around, I can jump, I can shoot a gun and all this. And, you know, sometimes you get into this chicken and an egg situation where you kind of get stuck because like, well, we kind of don't know how to make player abilities because we don't know what the enemies are going to do or the obstacles will be or, and we can't really do enemies because we don't know what the player is going to be. So I guess you have to pick something, right? You have to start somewhere. Maybe you have a fantasy about something like, I'm making a game about Batman and I know Batman is throwing batarangs. Like that's a player ability I want to have. All right, let's then figure out obstacles, challenges that require you to throw shit. 
And then finally, we got, as you do stuff in games, you have feedback. Like, this is all the stuff that's hitting you. You're, you're doing something, you press some buttons, you do something, and you're getting feedback. This is information, right? This is the order part of things. And you've got all the stuff that you have to learn. I have to learn how this game works. I have to learn how to operate this gun. I have to learn what this monster does. And where gameplay is, is I believe, on exactly the border between the order and, and chaos. Like, you need a mix of both, and it depends on your game. So, um, let's look at some practical example. Okay, let's take information, right? Imagine you're going into a dark room, and it's pitch dark, and I'm telling you, you need to find a key in the room. Well, it's impossible, right? Why? Because there's, you're, you're what? Because otherwise you don't have, you're, you're too much into the unknown, right? Like, I don't have enough information. But let me give you a flashlight. What do you do with the flashlight? You're basically getting some information from the unknown, right? Now you can analyze the, the, the place around you and like, okay, now I have enough information to start making decisions and, you know, start navigating. Who played Fortnite? Who haven't played Fortnite? Oh, come on, guys. Like, you have to play it. It's actually, and, and I don't care if you like it, but it's a really well-made game. Play it. Like, you want to be the last man standing in Fortnite, right? That's the goal game gives you. Your goal is like, I want to find a gun. How do you find a gun? Well, it's in the chest. How do you find a chest? Do you just randomly stumble into it? No. They have this glow, right? So you can kind of spot it. And then the really cool thing that they do with information is they give you audio cues. Because these things are humming. So you come across and you're like, and you're like, oh my god, there's a chest somewhere. Right? So you're like, just enough information, you have a clear goal, I want a gun, and there's a huge space of the unknown to explore, but I have just enough information, you know, to, to play, to have, to have gameplay. Um, can you have too much information? Yes? No? Yes. Are there CD Projekt people in the room? Okay. Please don't hate me. I really like your games. But I have an example from Cyberpunk. So um, here's like the, one of the first missions where you go through the hotel, right? And, and T-Bag asks you to find room 1237. Um, and what, what do you do in this situation, right? You, there, there are, there's a, it's a hotel, so there's like numbers on the doors. You would go through and say like, is it this door? No, is it this door? No, and eventually you would come across the, the right door and you're like, all right, I found it. Gameplay. It was me, I have a sense of ownership and achievement. But you have extra information in forms of quest marker. And it basically says, it's here. So then I don't, I don't longer, I no longer play, right? I don't play, I don't find it because it's already found. So like I cannot play finding it. And there's like another uh, clue here. It's just like, just follow the dots. Now, very important thing to understand is that this is not necessarily wrong. Here's why. Like, I can say this because I have absolutely no idea what the intent was for them. Like, if I wanted to make a finding game here, I want player to have the behavior of like, yeah, I want you to look at the doors and I want you to have this sense and that. I would do it without those markers. But maybe that's not what I wanted. Maybe they actually wanted you to be quick to get to where the action is and whatnot, right? Because then maybe, you know, they tested it and it's like, yeah, people are getting lost. Maybe, like, there's problems and we really want to just get player easily to this part because this is where the interesting parts that we want to focus on are. So, like, maybe that solution works for them. The reason I'm saying this is because, like, there's no silver bullet, right? You're, but the, the, the key here is, is that you need to understand what do you want. Because if that happens by accident, like, we want a player to be finding things, but he's not because he's just like, all right, it's, it's, it's here. So, you know, think about it. Think about what you want, what kind of behaviors and emotions you want for the player. Feedback. How do you think about feedback? Well, this is what happens when you press a button and then, right? Like, this is how, why I have, a, I, I have three kids and now I have a, a, a boy who's like a year and a half and he just fucking loves the elevator. Because he gets in and he presses a button and then the button lights up 
And then the door shuts down, and it's like, and then the whole thing starts to move. And he's just fucking ecstatic. Like, it's the coolest thing ever, right? Because feedback gives you a lot of pleasure, right? Just think about, like, when you're shooting in Call of Duty. Like, what happens, right? You press a trigger. Your pad starts to vibrate. You have haptic feedback. And then you see VFX coming from the muzzle. And then there's the sound of the gunshot. And then there's the sound of hitting the target, and then you have VFX showing that, and then you have the UI indicator saying that you hit, and so on and so on. There's so much cool feedback to tell it like, yeah, awesome. So, you know, whenever you're looking at your game, you can say like, all right, do I have enough, like, where's the problem? It's like, you know, the goal is clear, you have the obstacles, but it kind of, you know, it doesn't feel like the way it should, it's not as fun. Maybe the problem is with feedback, right? Like that's a lens that you can use. Learning, learning. I really like Gran Turismo because you can sp spend a lifetime learning this game. What can you learn? Like every single car drives differently. You have analog controls, right? So you have to really be good with your, your, your thumbs and, and, your, and, and your triggers. And you have to learn like, you know, like every track is different. So you have to learn like all the breaking points. And then you go to another car, and then you go to another track, and then on top of that, you have tire wear. So like through the course of the race, you have to learn even more because those, those braking points start to move. And then on top of that, you have, you have dynamic weather, which kind of you know, adds even more stuff that you have to learn. So does your game have enough stuff to learn? And obviously, it's not like, just like with everything is, it's, it's, it's not like you, ha you have to have a lot of everything. Because... Like, you have to learn a lot in these games, right? Like Dark Souls and Sekiro. It's like you have to learn all the patterns and timing windows and attacks and all that. It's not for everybody. Some people are like, yeah, it's like, it's, it's too much. I just want to whack some buttons and, and really feel good about it. It's like, I'm, I'm not going to learn. So again, it's like, well, what do you want? What do you want? What, who's your audience? Right? It's not about you. It's about for whom you're, you're, you're making this game. So yeah. There you have it. Like this is this is the sort of framework that I use, right? Like I can I can take whatever situation in gameplay, and at any point I can ask myself: Is the problem of information? Maybe it's not enough. Maybe it's too much. Is are the goals clear? Maybe there's too many goals. Um, is there conflict? Are is it in the right places? Like do I have the right obstacles? How, what about player abilities? What about feedback? What about learning? Right? So it's no longer about us talking about like, oh, I like this, or like, ah, oh, that, that sucks, like, this should be like this, this should be like, like, no, 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 no. Be specific, say like, the problem is, at this point on time, there's too many goals and player is just like in, unable to move because there's just like too many problems that he has to deal with. So like, okay, let's reduce number of goals, let's increase feedback. Like, you know, you can be very, you can have very meaningful conversations and trying to fix the right thing. But, the problem is that if you were to apply it to the whole game, especially if it's big and complex, it's, it's, it's impossible, right? Because games are huge. And so, so trying to see the whole thing and trying to find like the one problem that happens, it, it's very difficult. So, so let's talk about analyzing player experience. And this is something I actually learned from Kuba Grodzinski from Artifex Mundi. He had this absolutely fantastic way of sort of being able to cut the game into small pieces to help you fix specific parts. So let's talk about that. Who knows this game? All right. What's this game? League of Legends. Yeah, there we go. You can read. Great. Um, so for people who don't know this game, this is a game where there are two teams. This is a MOBA. There are two teams, and they're trying to destroy each other's base. Pretty complex game. So try to think about. You know, if you were to draw what's happening in the game on a timeline, right? Where on the left, we're starting, this is the start of the match, and then there's the end of the match. We're looking at a match for now. How could we sort of, because there's a lot of stuff happening, right? Like, how could we sort of cut into smaller pieces so that we can pinpoint problems and fix them? Well, one way to see it is like, all right, we can just think about the match as a whole, and there's some early game, and there's mid game, and there's late game. And now we can at least say, like, okay, we're just going to focus on what's happening in, in the early game. And then we can start asking questions, kind of using the same framework. It's like, all right, what are players trying to do? What are their goals? Both their own and what the game tells them, like, that this is their goal. Like, what are they doing? 
How do they feel about it? What kind of questions and what kind of thoughts are going through their head? Right? Like maybe at this stage, it's like, where the hell is my jungler? And why is this guy continuously ganking me? And like all that stuff, right? And then we can sort of try to understand like what mechanics are causing this, right? Like why am I feeling this? Why am I doing this? Like why do I have this question? Why cannot I find the answer? And you do it for the whole game, like, right? Because ultimately you want things to change, right? If, if, the, if I have exactly the same goals and exactly the same behaviors, all through the game, that's kind of boring, right? So things have to change somehow. Like for example, they don't give you all abilities at once. Like imagine if they would. How would that change how the game plays, right? Like immediately you have way more problems to think about, right? Because there's so many things that they can do. Like the game would be, have much uh, faster pace and all that. So maybe like strategically they said, you know what? This in-session growth in power and bringing you abilities, it's actually helping us you know, set up the pace, start a little bit slower, give you a little bit less problems to worry about, and then we escalate and so on and so on. Now, obviously, this is just one sort of way to see it, one perspective. We can zoom in into, let's say, a single team fight, right? So again, and we can cut it into pieces. And obviously, this is quite arbitrary because you can cut it yourself however you like, but we can say like, all right, so the first part of a team fight is that Baron is about to show up. Uh, for those of you who don't know League of Legends, Baron is like a huge monster that's very difficult to kill and everybody needs to come and then when you kill it, you get a great bonus and you can sort of snowball over the, uh, the other team. So about like 30 seconds, let's say it starts about 30 seconds before the Baron shows up, right? And we're like, all right, this is the first part. And it's like, at this point, our goal is kind of the best to get the best position, and this is what we do, and this is how it feels. And then it's the fight itself where things happen. And then there's, you know, we got the Baron, right? And now we want to snowball over people. We have the bonus. Now, the tricky part here is that you cannot just see it from the winning team perspective. You also have to see, like, okay, how does this experience look like for the team that lost the fight? What kind of goals do they have? How do they feel about it? And that only shows you that, you know, in order, like, you have to be really careful when you're adding stuff to your game because it affects all of those things, right? And you have to see all those perspectives and you need to know exactly what's happening. So, for example, I was working on this PvP first person game, and at some point in the match, uh, the game director got sniped and he died in <laughs> one shot, and he was like, immediately, I was like, all right, like, we, we need to lower the damage on sniper rifles 50% down. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's talk about it. Because if we do that, like we solve problem for you, right? You can no longer be one shot and you're happy because you're no longer getting frustrated. But how does it look like for the other guy? Like he was sitting there sniping and he took a shot and he one shot you and he feels fucking amazing. So if we just go immediately for you know, lowering the damage, that means we're solving problem for you but we're creating the problem for the other guy. So maybe we should start thinking about like, okay, how did this happen? What were you doing? What was the other person doing? Maybe it's too easy to take that shot. Maybe we have too long line of sights. Like, that's why I can take that shot from the you know, other side of the map. And it's like, that's the problem, you know? Like, it's not the damage, it's just like, you can shoot across the whole map. Like, let's fix this, and so on and so on, right? And obviously, you can also zoom out. So you can think about long term. It's like, First 10 hours of me spending time with game, I'm gonna have different goals, I'm gonna have different questions, like, what does this button do? Like, how do I, how do I win? Like, what does this ability do? And it's like, I have, I have different goals, I'm trying to do different things. And then maybe later, I'm, I'm mastering it, and I'm like, all right, all right, all right, now I know how it works, like the basic mechanics, I got it. Now, maybe my goal is, I wanna find the best build possible, and I wanna maximize my opportunities to do this. Like, so, you know, again, my questions, my thoughts, my, my behaviors, my goals, they're, they're continuously changing throughout the experience. And then maybe I've seen it all. And I'm like, all right, what else can I do in this game? Because my goal is like, all right, I, I did the thing, I, I kind of know, right? I'm still playing, so it's almost like I'm playing a different game every time. Um, and, I, and I guess, again, this is sort of a warning that, that our games are really, really, really complex and, and you, have, you need to be able to zoom in and, and zoom out and, and really be able to find where the real problem is and how, what is the effect that it's going to have on the behaviors and emotions of the player. So there you have it. 
Um, these are the three things that I do. I try to understand the player fantasy first, then I use that new age bullshit yin yang framework to help me pinpoint exactly the problem. Feedback, learning, goals, conflict, obstacles, abilities, information. And then, yeah, um, whenever I'm getting overwhelmed, I'm trying to understand the player experience, zoom in and zoom out. And I, that's what I got for you today. Thank you. <laughs>